Welcome to Chew on This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion that these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. Is there such a thing, quote unquote, or an entity, if you will, called the devil? Big question mark. Is there such a thing? Hmm. This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with my buddy, Pastor Robin Bjornson, and we thank you for joining us for this session of Chew on This. We are on the topic of Summer of Lies. We're wrapping up that amazing series, and this is actually week 14 of having conversations about lies in our life. This conversation about, is there such thing as a devil or is there just evil or what is it, was had on Wednesday night, August 10th. And we were dissecting how lies are told to us. We'll be doing that for the next few podcasts here in this series. And this one is focusing on being lied to by the devil. Now, depending on where your church connection is or your Bible connection or your whatever, that statement could go, uh, or it could say, oh yeah, sure there is. And you could be, ah, oh, lady, you'd be crazy. And it's like, yeah, you go right ahead and think that, that's fine. But I would like to invite you to listen through the, this this session today, this podcast, this episode, and just open your thinking process of evil. Let's just start with that. Where where does evil come from? And I just, at the beginning, I know this is getting really heavy, but this is where I, I get stuck or where I end, I should say, where I land. As a, a person who's lived a good portion of life already and looking at just man's inhumanity to man. Uh, I mean, you can look at in the animal kingdom, how animals will react and do to protect their territory, the things that they do. But when you look at man's inhumanity to man, there is a line where it goes crazy. Mm-hmm. How could somebody, and it usually deals with, for me, when I see adults torturing children, mm-hmm. not just being stupid, selfish, mean, and cruel, mm-hmm. but the actual line when you move over to torturing, where there is no reason to, it's just crazy craziness and we th- call them we would label them mentally ill or not there or big di- big diagnosis of something because animals don't do that nothing in nature does that so what would cause a, a human being to go into that type of what we would call evil with a little e behavior I've had this conversation quite a bit with my spouse and just wondering there to me, that says that there is a source of evil. I, because I believe scripture is 100% true and accurate, we just don't always get it right, but we work at it. Mm-hmm. But it definitely talks about there being an entity that owns evil that is called Satan in scripture and we call the devil. So with that being said, agree or disagree, I want to let you know where, where I park to, where I come from when I talk about this topic, that there is a source, it is out there, and it does affect us whether we realize it or not. So when we're talking about this summer of lies, how lies are told to us, putting our, letting our skepticism still be there because nobody's asking us to not think. This whole, this whole uh, series, this whole podcast is dedicated to making us think differently. And just allow that to be there. So with that, we started out with this conversation that following Jesus is a fill in the blank, getting an idea of those who were in the, the community last night that could easily answer that. And, and they talked about it is a choice, it is gladness, that they had different, different remarks to it. And then we talked about it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle you choose because scripture does talk about choices and making them and sometimes the choice we make is part of an equation and we don't realize what it's going to give us and we're surprised but scripture teaches about don't be surprised if you choose this this is going to happen if you isolate yourself you are going to be alone god created us to live in community it doesn't have to be a ginormous community so the whole process of it is a lifestyle. And then talking about it being a journey, being a choice, all of this amazing things. But I would like to throw out this concept that I got out of the book, Live No Lies by John Mark Comer. And I highly recommend it. It reminds me, uh, Pastor Robin, of the 
the Three Kingdoms series mm-hmm. that my husband preached, and we've used, I've used it a lot in other classes and, and at our women's retreat, where it talks about there's God's kingdom, there's the enemy's kingdom, and then there's our kingdom. T- talking about how s- spiritually and physically things are set up for this planet to run. Um, John Mark Comer, uh, t- or Comer, how would you pronounce it? Comer? I think Comer. Comer. But- that, yeah. He, he approaches it from a different angle, but truly enjoying the, the process as looking at what, is it, what does it mean to have a, a source of ev- evil that is there? How does it affect us? So he also comes to this statement of, are we exiles? Are we living in Babylon? Are we at war? Are we in a battle? And some of those images individuals have a hard time wrapping their head around because they, they, they want peace. I mean, this idea of war, what do you mean war every day? I don't want to live with that in my mind. But using war with a small w, like <laughs> if anybody has walked through sobriety, you know the things that are at war with you, that type of war. So there is, I would say that following Jesus is a battle sometimes. It is a war. You are doing war against things that really want your, wants you to fail, doesn't want your health. It doesn't want you to realize all you've been created to be. And it just wants to mess up your life. That It's not just humanity. It's not just our choices. We actually live as supernatural beings having a temporary physical experience. I believe that to be true. And if that is true, there's other supernatural forces around us that we live supernaturally as well as physically. It's kind of crazy, I know. But as you settle down into it and start thinking, huh, and I'm not the only one who has said this, but that's my phraseology. And I think I think that helps with this understanding that we live in a war, that we live in a battle. It, it, it isn't always physical, although our physical bodies react to it. It is more on the supernatural side, and it does affect our emotions and our intelligence and all that type of stuff. So with that being said, we're looking into jumping into this. There are, there is this... In my head, again, there's this math equation. There's this equation of what it looks like to live amongst evil. And scripture is very forthright talking about we have an enemy. He hates us and we're living in his world. That's a whole other sermon, Mm -hmm. a whole other message, a whole other podcast. But here, taking a chart, taking some, uh, it's an amazing chart. You, You need to read it, live no lies. This, this chart just was really helpful in redefining that, that phraseology as far as our kingdom, the enemy's kingdom, and God's kingdom. But he, he segments it into three sections as well. He says there's deceptive ideals. There's deceptive ideas, and I did it last night too. There's no <laughs> L on there. There's deceptive ideas that we have, and that comes from the devil. That comes from the enemy. They're deceptive. They're lies. Big, fat, liar lies. And then there's those things play to our disordered desires. That's our flesh. It actually is tempting to use a word that has a different meaning for us. There's this temptation that it plays to. It's the big fat chocolate cake that's filled with with poison, mm-hmm. all right? So it plays to those desires that have become disordered and that are normalized in a sinful society, a society that doesn't embrace biblical principles or Christian our, our Christian God, all right? So there's in the sinful society, which is called the world. All right, so these are my words taking his chart. So don't say that this is what the dude believes. You need to read his book. But this is my taking his chart and looking at it and go, I like how this, this equation, I think with time and my brain perking on the stuff that I've done before, this is going to turn into instead of a salvation equation, the temptation equation or there something like that. But because it really, the, those three ingredients. We live in a society that has different priorities than what scripture says. Some are similar, but a lot are, are different. So, and, and some of them are blatantly different, and yeah. some of them are super subtly different. That is true. Can I ask you if you have an example in your beautiful brain this morning? Well, I think about, um, because in, in the process that he talks about here with deceptive ideas moving into that play to disordered desires, my mind immediately stops because we talk about this around here all the time. They're not necessarily disordered desires. They could be completely legitimate desires. We have been created for oh, community. Yes. We have been created yep. for uh, sexual 
sexual fulfillment in its appropriate place. We've been created to enjoy food. I mean, we've got some perfectly legitimate idea uh, desires, yes, right? Yes, yes. Um, and then those can those be disordered? Absolutely they can. I wonder, but there's a spectrum in there somewhere, right? Yes. But he, we see the process even of taking deceptive ideas and um, creating... Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. There's so much smoke and mirror associated with it, right? The bait and switch. Um, And... Yeah. yeah. So it's mm-hmm. it's so my my heart hurts as we go through this process because you can see um, unless you are surrounded and I'm sure we'll get to this unless we are surrounded by a community and engaged in a community that is for us and we are for them. Mm-hmm. If we're not, we're relying on our own wisdom yes. or experience or lack thereof, <laughs> thereof. Yeah. which makes us that much more susceptible to deceptive ideas because yes. you know if you don't have the the wisdom to tap into that that's a deceptive idea it can sure look like a good one right right hence deception yes right yes right <laughs> Sorry. and and then there's also that nuance of things that you know for you other people it's well coming back mm-hmm. to sobriety mm-hmm. there's just Alcohol is alcohol. Mm-hmm. There's those that actually, in my terminology, I'd say they're allergic to it. Their body can't handle. Mm-hmm. There's no shutoff valve for them. Mm-hmm. So there there are some things, too, that for us. So there are the things that just don't touch. They're going to burn you and leave a scar, and you're not right. going to want to live with that scar. Don't be silly! Or don't be stupid. That's how mm-hmm. I hear it in my head. But then there's those things that, for you, this just makes your life a mess. Please yeah. don't do that. Right. I know. I know you well enough. This is this is not a good coping mechanism for you, or this is not mm-hmm. a good whatever, whatever mm-hmm. it may be. So living in that that whole personal relation relationship piece with this, we could we're going to be uh-huh, chewing on this one for a while <laughs> nice. and figuring out how to fit it in. But I I love finding new resources and this this mm-hmm. one here. Um, Live No Lies was recommended by some really good friends of ours that, you know, and they did it for training for their staff. And I was just delighted to see, oh, they found a book that they like that much, that mm-hmm. they use it as training. And I can see where. So here we go. We talked about following Jesus is a what and understanding when if we use the word war or battle, that we know what we're talking about. That there is this, oh, it's just like, oh, well, but I don't want to do that. But oh, why do I make those choices? As Paul says, why do I do what I don't want? The thing I don't want to do, I'm doing. Understanding our physical being has a lot of power. But no, it, does, it is, cannot overpower our supernatural being unless we give it a road to do that on. Mm-hmm. So here we went into another question. This one was not popular. <laughs> they didn't want to engage with this. I asked them, how smart is man? What are some statements that declare our brilliance? How smart are we? And they're not sure what I was going after, so they oh. said nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so for mm-hmm. a while, and I started out, just had the wonderful opportunity to go to the Science Museum and see the... Um, what I call the space exhibit. I know it has a fancier name than that, but the moon, and we got a chance to walk through a simulator of being on the space station, and I had to shut my eyes after two seconds because I felt dizzy. But they said that almost every astronaut that goes through the training, the first few times in there, they get this dizzy. You have to get modulated to it. You have to get a cue. Mm-hmm. You have to get whatever that wonderful word mm-hmm. is. Where accustomed you're, to that, it. Accustomed mm-hmm. to it. Where you, so in there, while we're enjoying this great experience, and then to see the Omni film, which is really oh, fun, yeah. is this phrase is a new phrase. And I know where it comes from because where our society is right now is the phrase trust science. You need to trust science. And it's on coffee mugs and shirts. It's all over the place, even on little cute little bags, I think. Mm. So that is something that a statement that declares our brilliance. And it is true. Science is an amazing thing. It's actually a wonderful way to unpack and find the hand of a creator. Mm -hmm. And I will share one thing with you that has just bugged my brain. And after I heard it, it's going to be there for the rest of my life. And unfortunately, I can't remember the scientist who this is part of his his experience in in his studying, because he was part of the team that studied the the DNA structure when that was discovered. He's in that circle of scientists, all right? And he said the thing that he keeps coming back to is who put the code in our DNA. Because our DNA is coded just like a computer. It does things all on its own, and we can just watch it go. Who put the code in there? How did it get there? 
So you, if you think that evolution has produced a human being, then you would think evolution could produce a laptop. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Somebody quoted it. And it was great in the, the group that we were in listening to that I start chuckling. I can remember that statement for myself, and it has hit home with me because I love the DNA structure that that whole, what do we call it? A uh, helix? G- yeah. Mm-hmm. Is a work of art. I right. look at it as our God is an artist. That thing's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I know you've seen some of the, mm-hmm. I found a, an alchemist who creates scientific jewelry and oh, all of yeah. this and creates a, and some of the stuff on there is just fascinating because mm-hmm. it is so science in my understanding challenges us to look at our creator in a different way right. with a much deeper understanding of his brilliance and his artistry mm-hmm. so how smart is man what are some statements that declare our brilliance is there anything that comes to you here i know i didn't forewarn you to be part of the team that talks about well, I what comes to my mind is not necessarily about man's wisdom, um, but the um, I can't think about man's wisdom without thinking about the fall of man. Okay, yeah. So that's all factored in there. Yes, and we have good intentions. Mm-hmm. Yes, we <laughs> usually do. Yes. we usually have good intentions. Yes. We just can't yes. see down the road where so, it comes. <laughs> we don't we don't get to that point yeah. though unless we think we're we're spiritual beings as well as physical. Exactly. The fall of whatever. We just yep. people making dumb choices. Mm-hmm. So looking at this idea that, that we see ourselves as highly intelligent oh, individuals, yeah. especially in our day and age. Look, mm-hmm. we created a computer. Oh, so right, much so further. Yeah. All that. And all of the things that are coming and the things that, you know, science is playing with, they probably shouldn't be playing with, too. Some of those types of things. Mm-hmm. So that we are, as as a species, highly evolved. There we go. But there is this thought I'd like to throw out as we're looking at this, um, how lies are told to us. This really interesting thought process that started way back way, way back and is recorded in the Bible in the 11th chapter of Genesis. And it it touches this how smart is man. And every time I read it, I just, I get a little bit more um, (laughs) incredulous at our aptitude for (laughs) self-delusion. I get, um, I laugh. Human beings haven't changed a whole lot Mm-mm. since the day Adam and Eve were created. Right. And once again, I, I realize I'm coming from a biblical point of view about this. So you just going to have to embrace my fine self as you go <laughs> through the podcast. Please don't leave us. There's some more coming. So looking at this idea about the intelligence of man, which we just got back from a conference being around some of the smartest people I've ever been around who mm-hmm. had absolutely no ego. Right. Which, until you pointed that out, I'm thinking... That is what is the difference here. There isn't this competition that I'm better than you. There's this competition for truth and understanding. Amen. Yeah. And it was just a delightful experience. So here we're going to find a different type of attitude. Here in Genesis 11, 1 through 9, and un- not unfortunately, but it, I don't like to read long passages of Scripture on a podcast, but I'm going to read this one so you get an understanding, and we all together as we continue into the podcast, get an understanding of this, this story. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech at this time, it says in verse 1 of Genesis 11. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, or Shinar, and that is uh, modern-day Iraq. And they dwelt there, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Let's get some concrete. No, it's not concrete. Concrete's here. Let's make cement. No, it's not cement. But let's take what we have, and we know how to make these bricks. And they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. So they knew what they were doing. They're highly, they're they're intelligent. They understand what's around them. Humans were created to have intelligence, and they can think scientifically because our creator is scientific. So they they created these bricks, and they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, artistry coming out of them. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they began to do with it. This is what they do when they're all together. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. 
I've made me some smart children and it looks like they're not following directions and they are hell bent on doing whatever they want to, is how I would interpret that in my imagination. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So if you notice a little bit of condensation or a lot of condensation in that portion of scripture, you're supposed to. Okay? Condescension. Condensation is what's on the window. Condescension. There, there we go. go. Good morning. Because <laughs> it is humid and it is wet. And I can hardly <laughs> wait for winter because I love winter. <laughs> okay? So here we go. I'm going to blame my, my, my brain fog on humidity until winter comes, just so you know. Okay. A note of condescension. And so there is. He is. He's like, ha. Oh. And the reason why is in Genesis 1, 28 and Genesis 9, 1, God is very, very adamant about, I need you to go and multiply and fill the earth with human beings. This is your job. I need you to move out and, and territory. I need you to create families. I need you to husband the earth. I need you to grow and plant and be. And here, they aren't honoring that, as we read in this portion of Genesis 11. They wanted to build this thing, which is a pyramid or a ziggurat, or a ziggurat, however you want to pronounce it. And that type of pyramid, they believe this is what it was, would have steps that go up to the top. And up at the top would be the this holy place, this cradle of offering. And they would be able to offer it to the gods and inviting the gods to come sit. And it was so tall, they felt that the gods from heaven, or the god from heaven, whichever mindset they were, <laughs> and maybe they thought they were mini gods. Who knows by this time? Because look how smart they are. We can make bricks. We make Legos, and ooh, look what we can build. And I get it, though. Obviously, we know that our ancestors were highly intelligent. Our ancients were highly intelligent. So up there, they had this... this cradle, if you will, for the gods to sit or offerings to sit for the gods to come and consume. So they didn't just make a pyramid or a big building to say, yay, we built a big tower. They were creating something that had spiritual significance. Mm -hmm. And so here, as the Lord looks down, he sees his children disobeying this, this foundational principle you have to move out and you have to multiply and, and fill the earth. I don't want you to create and to be in this community that says, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's everybody who built the pyramid sign your name on the brick over here. Well, we want people to come for all of our future to come and applaud what we have done and spending all their time and energy there instead of creating farms and creating things that are going to be more long-term for society to grow and to flourish, knowing that in order to flourish, they're going to need to multiply. And they didn't like that idea, so they just decided not to do it. <laughs> so Yeah, and I wonder, what was it about being scattered abroad over the face of the earth that they didn't want to do? Well, there was something there that was... Well, I think it's scary. Yeah, well... Who wants to move out on the side where we haven't investigated? It, it requires the frontier. Trust. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. A different adventurous experience mm -hmm. and nobody's going to see how fine you are except the you know little crowd that you have and mm -hmm. so the, the whole process of not understanding why they were creating and what they were doing they just wanted to applaud their fine selves and so my question is after that the, the this deceptive idea or what i would call a lie man's wisdom knows no bounds man's wisdom knows no bounds did this take care of that and did the humankind say oh ho oh, we will never do that again god we're sorry we will never elevate what we want above what you want for us and we done with it what's interesting is it starts there in genesis 11 and it goes all the way through to the end of scripture yeah. and lives on today very mm -hmm. much alive and there was another point i brought another idea to make it more now this is ancient history this other one isn't quite so ancient it's not really current history but it's still american history in the 1930s there is this big beautiful ship called the titanic now, if you've seen the movie, that's okay, you got an idea. But what you need to do is you need to go to the museum and see when they have that exhibit. You need to go see the exhibit if it ever, whenever it comes back out. When this exhibit came out, the movie was still around. I hadn't seen the movie because some people told me about 
portions of it, and I didn't want I didn't want to grieve like that mm-hmm. because these are real people being. Mm-hmm. This was a life, and mm-hmm. I had done some reading on it before, but it, in watching and and being in the exhibit and dealing with the anticipation of the world's most amazing experience being on the ship that will not sink, it can't sink, and there's. C class, B class, and A class passengers, and and how they're where they stay in the ship, and of course C class is at the bottom with no windows, and I believe everyone in C class died. Hmm. There was no room on those boats, the few lifeboats they had for anyone in C class, and that's the part that, excuse my vernacular, in my my wor- world we don't say this unless we know no kids X. I don't want to interrupt parents with their raising principles, but I was so pissed off. Mm-hmm. Going through that exhibit, mm-hmm. after I learned that, and they and they list the names, they list mm-hmm. the passenger roster, wow. and the ages and how many kids died. Wow! And they drowned to death. And I mean, okay, so my brain can't see the movie because that's right. all I go. I just yep. can't go there. Yep. But seeing all of that and thinking, and the reason why is because they built a boat that could not sink, and they needed more deck space. Why should we put these? lifeboats we don't need them so for those who go on cruises and are on ships and they have those trainings that you don't get very far and do mm-hmm. much until you find out where yep. your your space is what boat you're on where's your life jacket you have to be ready mm-hmm. and that's why they have those is because of what happened on the titanic so apparently this idea that our wisdom knows no bounds that we just know the best we are so smart that is around all the time now um, human ego is human ego but is there something adding to that? Is there something outside of our our spirit, our physical being, our, our brain and our intelligence that that is constantly challenging us that you just you just know. Mm-hmm. You you are the smartest thing on the planet. Mm-hmm. You you are so intelligent. You're gonna figure there isn't any problem you can't figure out. And it appears that that never seems to leave us. So why why is that that humanity can't embrace the idea? I can only know so much, and there's going to be all this stuff we haven't figured out. So there is this phrase I heard in an old old movie, and it states it this way: Man cannot acclaim the authority of God. Man cannot acclaim the authority of God. And I encourage you to go on our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. There's 72 pages of notes for this this topic. And in there, there's uh, Exodus 22, Isaiah 48, 17, and Hosea 13, 4 that deal with this idea of God's authority. So when we look at man's wisdom, you no know, has no boundaries. I mean, we just can learn and do whatever. We are dealing with the same thing that the Tower of Babel did, this understanding of, wait a minute, we are supernatural beings, and there isn't any way you're going to top that. I mean, there isn't any way you're going to know that until you become totally supernatural, which happens after we die. So just looking at this wonderful process that we need to hopefully a little pin cushion of thought that we make as human beings, these declarations of our intelligence, and this is how everything works and this is going to be, but there's a whole lot we don't know. Mm-hmm. So looking at man's wisdom knows no bounds, there's the Tower of Babel, there is the Titanic as an experience, there is scripture that con- confronts that as a lie, but then there is this whole process of this idea of worshiping our intelligence or the intellectual of our society, there is something that bolsters this, something that feeds it, and it's not just human ego. There is this bolstering the lie that we, as a society, worship intellectia. We mm-hmm. we bow to them as far as, okay, you, you know what is right. But I brought up the question, is Jesus smarter than, is Jesus smarter than what Stephen Hawking was? Because that's a name people know. Unbelievable scientist. Mm-hmm. Um, wrestled with this concept if there's a supernatural intelligent being behind all this. Mm -hmm. So wherever, however, that Mm -hmm. is. But would you say that he's smarter than him? It's like, well, Pastor, oh, Jesus was on the planet. It's like, yeah. But he is 100% man and 100% God. And all of the theories and stuff we are trying to understand were created by him. So, But that can't be because he was a human being. So all of that amazing, confusing, wonderful you're not going to get it till you're dead stuff. 
never comes into the equation of this understanding. And there's a reason why we slowly but surely forget that scripture has truth and it has definition to a whole lot of what we don't understand. And we try to, well, this is my this is my declaration of what it means. All right, and it comes from this idea of worshiping human intelligence. So there is this uh, shift theory. You and I had an opportunity to, mm-hmm. to, to see redefined at a con- conference we were just at, the idea of shifting things from one place to another. There's an actual theory and a process to this where there's five stages of it, and go access the notes and you can see it. And I believe that there was a shift, this concept of shifting our society away from being influenced by the belief in Christ. And it's been slowly but surely, and it's been fertilized by human beings. But I think the shift in this whole process comes from a source of evil, Mm -hmm. comes from somewhere. And first thing is, move, move society from people who believe in Christ from being a majority to a minority. And if you can't move them, deceive society into thinking they are not, there's not that many of them. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people who believe and live by scripture, there's only a few. Mm -hmm. It's not like it used to be. So it's easier for us now to, to bring what is really helpful into politics and into society because all that scripture stuff just complicates and it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It makes society, I mean, it's the reason we have all the problems we've had in the past are because of people making those. And it's like, okay, so all of that phraseology really does come in it and it creates an effect on how we speak in society, what we do, how much we trust scripture, how often it comes out. And that, that was my closing challenge last night. And we will do that when we close this podcast episode as well. And here there is this thing about just questioning whether or not people actually believe in Scripture. There was, here in the state of Minnesota, up in Duluth, there is this mansion called the Glen Sheen Mansion. It is a beautiful mansion, and I've toured it quite a few times. Really enjoy. I really enjoy going in there and imagining, what would it be like to live in a house like this? Mm-hmm. What would it be like? And, and it's beautiful. And, they, and then they have, you know, art and, and a music room. And then they have the library. And, and to just get an idea of, of what did it take to build that structure. But there's also a, a dark history of things that happened there. But So they give you a tour. And I encourage everyone who goes, everyone everywhere needs to go to the North Shore of Minnesota because it's unlike, it's just an amazing experience. You have to get north of two harbors. You just have to get up there and, and pick pick whatever you like. You pick your passion, whatever you like to do up there. There's something for everybody. But while you go through, stop in Duluth and tour the mansion. And it is beautiful when you walk in and you walk in this amazing big hall. You go through these big doors with all this wood carving. And then you walk and they, the doors can hide in these pockets so they don't look like doors. I mean, it's just fascinating, all of the artistry and, and talent and technique. And But you walk and there's this great big hall and you look to the left and that's where the music room is. You look to the right and that's where the study is and the dining area and stuff. So And then right in front of you, this ginormous staircase. And it's just beautiful. Now, one of the first times I went there, I had an, an, a person more my age doing the tour and talking about. Now, this family was very much involved in their community, the Glensheens, and they they uh, were part of the Methodist Church, I believe, and they did, uh, and, and the Methodist Church said, dancing is a sin, so they could not have a ballroom. They wouldn't do it because they wanted to honor the church that they belonged to. But when you walk into the, and you see into the main part of the house, and you see this ginormous entryway, it was amazing to watch our um, our guide look at it and say, well, you notice how long this is? And he gave us the dimensions and then how wide this is. He goes, you know, it's actually almost the size of a ballroom floor. <laughs> but it's the entryway. And I'm laughing. It's like, yes, I understand that. Because here you want to be part of your community. You understand what the church is teaching. This isn't a biblical pre- principle that dancing is a sin. It is their interpretation of our society. And if you don't dance, you're not going to be tempted. So it's like the pharisaical laws. Don't do this, and then you're going to have an easier. So I get it. But in his private life, and because he was a businessman and dancing is part of of the dinners and entertainment, that in his own private home, no problem. But he's not going to publicly do this. He's not going to have a ballroom in his house. Mm -hmm. But if he needs to do this, just because he enjoys it or because it's part of his business world, it's going to be just fine. Now, I laughed and enjoyed that. Now, I went another time and another, and 
by the time I get a really young individual being the tour guide, and we went through all of that, and he never talked about that, never mm -hmm. talked about their commitment to their civil commitments and being part of a church and whatever. And I asked him about it, and he goes, well, they may have went to church, but they weren't very religious, so we don't think it's really influenced their life much, so we don't include it. Wow, interesting. And I want to poke him in the eye. It's like, how in the world can you take a 21st century lens and interpret this time of life. You have to take that out of your eyeball and go back and what was life back like then? Mm -hmm. What was it like to be part of your society and be involved in church and how they honored it? This was his way. He didn't have a ballroom because he was honoring his church. Mm -hmm. And so just navigating all of that, it was just a, an interesting thing. This idea of being the cognitive minority is the phrase where we aren't as Christians, we're not an ethnic minority because there's all different types of ethnicities that we've seen at the conference we were just at that have fallen in love with Jesus Christ and, and study scripture to, to have an amazing physical experience as a supernatural being. So we are not an ethnic minority, but we're definitely a cognitive minority. That's what they are, are saying in our society. And, and it is actually working, unfortunately, because there's only, as Barna, which is an amazing research organization, a Christian think tank, if you will, that they make the statement that about 49% of millennials and 65% of American adults identify as quote unquote Christian, but only about 10% of them actually read their Bible, live according to it. So the, the, the other ones are not going to say that they do that. I mean, I, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I believe in God. And that's about where it ends. But then there's these that 10%. So it really is a small number that and, and how in the world did that happen in such sh sheer in such a short amount of time in our our history as a nation? So there's this moving them this idea of moving us from the majority to the minority. Is that because we've evolved, or is that because there is a source of evil in our society wanting mm -hmm. to discount this as part of the human equation of how to live happy? Mm -hmm. So after we move something from the majority to the minority, then we're going to shift shift their place in culture from a place of honor to a place of shame. And that we have seen because of human choices. And yes, I am glad that we know what different, none of this should be hidden. Mm -hmm. Sin shouldn't be hidden like right. this, especially when it comes to an organization. But it used to be, if you watch old movies, like someone here in this room does, that whenever that there was a lawman, there was a, a pastor in the town, and together they fought, fought evil and they were respected, both equally respected. And unfortunately, we live in a society where not both are held suspect. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Is that because we've evolved? Or is that because there's a source of evil trying to make us redefine who has wisdom and who who is here to actually help? Mm -hmm. And so looking through this, Christians used to be trusted to do the right thing because of the influence of our faith in Christ, but now we be, have fallen prey to this lie of, well, it it doesn't resonate with me, so I don't think it's that big of a deal. And instead of wrestling with what Scripture says and making the outright, well, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to, but instead we discount it as, well, it, it, it's only a guidebook. It's really not mm -hmm. an actual owner's manual of how to live as a human. So shifting this place, um, looking at, I think, I believe both Yale and Harvard began as pastoral training schools. Right. And now people would laugh in your face if they thought that's what you were going to those schools for that. Why would you pay that for that kind of education? It's only for these who think liberally and understand how society really works and can make a real contribution to society. Mm -hmm. Even back when Diedrich Bonhoeffer, we're going back to World War II times, when he made the decision, because he comes from an, an extremely intelligent family, and he was looking at two, I don't know if it was a mathematician, he was looking in the sciences or becoming a pastor and studying there. And his family, you could tell there was a little bit of sadness when he chose to be a theologian instead, because they weren't quite, and then the way he handled it, they thought he was a bit crazy because he was really bent on developing community. In my understanding, in my opinion, he's one of the first ones who created what we would call a quiet time, this private devotion time, and how scripture really can affect your life and infect your life in a healthy way. So. It, it has been going on for a very, very long time. Progressive thinkers, quote-unquote progressive thinkers, have been around and have influenced our society since before the 30s. And some of the things that we have now started back then as a way to get rid of the um, people who aren't smart enough. We don't want them to have a voice in politics. We don't want them to 
be seen as someone who can contribute. We just want them to be quiet. We would prefer for them to be the ones to fight wars and to die. And if you want to do, um, huh, I wasn't going to bring this up. I did last night. We talked a little bit about it because I don't want it to bring shame or confusion. But if you look at the history of abortion and why it was started by Margaret, mm -hmm. Her last name starts with an S. Sanger. Sanger. That she really wanted to use it in the progressive movement to get rid of those people that really shouldn't rep replicate and have children anyway. To the point where they talked about racism, who should marry. So if you think Hitler and Nazism was an anomaly, it wasn't. The progressives of that time, they were talking like that, not just in Germany. And that was her opinion. That's not your opinion. Oh, it's definitely not my opinion. It's absolutely ridiculous. And it's a stinking lie. And it's shifting, this idea. But... Now we just think of abortion as a right, or unfortunately some people use it as a form of birth control. Or It's part, it's like, no, abortion is removing a human being from society. And please feel free to disagree with me. I, you can do that, but we can agree to disagree here. But where it came from, and the very process that it is now seen as something that there's no shame attached to it, and how did that happen? Because when it started, oh no, oh no. And I, I understand people have died because this hasn't been legal, but I wonder if there's a different approach than just this. So here we go shifting our place and culture <clears throat> from a place of honor to a place of shame. And I would be looked at shamefully in some, and I am in some sectors because I am definitely rooted into this concept of what we would label as pro-life. My statement is, when did the baby become the problem? Right. The baby isn't the problem. Let's, and not just stop there. Nobody should just stop there. If this is going on, we need to embrace females that are pregnant and don't have a source of right. help yeah. and walk with them, not just say, you can't do this mm -hmm. and then be done. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's a community issue. It needs mm -hmm. to be handled in a community mm -hmm. manner. So today we live in a society where faith in the public square is a big no-no. You don't bring it up. You don't bring up politics and you don't bring up faith. Faith and politics. I used to uh, be a parent volunteer when our kids were in school and I was the parent that showed up and went on conferences with school staff and stuff like that because I just loved education, loved the people that wanted to support our schools and our teachers, some of my favorite people on the planet, and that that's what they told me, knowing I'm a pastor, these are two things we don't bring up. I was like, oh, no problem. And then I had to ask myself, where in the world did that rule come from? Mm -hmm. Why are we so incapable of talking about faith and politics? And I, and I get it. We were just at a conference, and they didn't want to deal with it there because I'm assuming, well, fireworks. And I have no problem not saying anything like that. But why has it become the things you don't talk about? Mm -hmm. Where did this come from where these things are now considered shameful instead of being part of the vibrant part of our community? Well, and who gets to decide that? Yeah. Who gets to decide what's shameful and what's not talked about? Yes. Somebody's already been made inferior by that decision. Oh, you bet. The yeah. person who holds the power makes exactly. the other ones inferior. Yeah. Yep. So then, then we label, <laughs> not that we've experienced this lately in our society. So we move something from a majority to a minority opinion. Not that many people think that. Then we shift their standing. Oh, you know, really, that isn't an honorable thing to, to be. That isn't an honorable thing to vote for. That isn't an honorable thing to think about. So you just keep it quiet. You always have your guard up. It's like, oh, no, you know, being a pastor used to be a thing of honor wherever you went. And now they look at you. Are you a good one? Or bad? And why in the world would you do that? Why would you go to school for that? All that. So... And if we try to embrace our Christian history, we're seen as being political, especially here in America. Mm -hmm. All right. So all of that is like it's become this don't bring it up stuff. And then the third thing, third and last here in this process of being worshiping of, of intelligence and in, of the intelligentsia, there is this let's put a label on it. Let's make it really, really easy. And I'm going to put a label on your forehead and it tells and it warns people what's coming. All right. So we've gone as Christians from being a trusted group of people to being an odd group to being a dangerous group. Mm -hmm. Those ideas in scripture are dangerous and they've caused all the problems we have in society right now. Well, who gets to define that without a conversation? conversation. Mm -hmm. I would like you to know that all of the energy that came behind the end of slavery and declaring slavery is an inherent evil wherever it may be, as we're experiencing today in sex trafficking and slave trafficking still happens. Children are abducted to become slaves as well, not just sex slaves, but other slaves. So that, that is just evil. Where does that evil come from? 
All right. I believe it comes from a source of evil, an entity called the devil. But now it's like, no, Christians are dangerous. That very concept, when it started, started in England with a pastor who was feeling the evil of it. It's like, this must stop. And how long he fought and was ridiculed. And you're going to wreck our economy if you do that. And we feel it in our soil. We have it in our history here as Americans. That the impetus of that came from scripture. This is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is wrong and will always be wrong. Mm -hmm. So here we are trying to put a label now that, oh no, scripture just causes these problems. All right. So here we're stuck. We're stuck with this, the worship of human intelligence saying all of this is wrong. Where does that come from? Is it just the evolution of humanity or is there a voice of evil speaking into our existence that's saying you need to back away because scripture really is a nice it's a nice collection of sayings and thoughts but you read it as you would a fictional book all right so we are smarter than our ancestors we think we are because you know they trusted the bible and used it as a guide for community but we're smarter than that this is called chronological snobbery which i think is funny <laughs> and it really is and, and you see it uh, i love when you're watching i love history sta the history station and discovery and all of that i enjoy all of that amazing stuff that you can learn by just watching an actual worthwhile tv program but this idea of the myth of progress that we are moving forward and learning all this stuff and we'll become forever enlightened and understand how all of the world works because it just happened to evolve this way and that we think we're smarter than our ancestors and all you have to do is start reading history going back especially to the Egyptian culture and realize there's a whole lot of stuff that happened that we're never going to know because it died with them mm -hmm. and it should bother us because there was a lot that they, I mean, mm -hmm. just their whole society was mm -hmm. amazing. The library at Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you know, as a weapon of warfare, when a country would come, uh, take over another country, they would uh, burn their library. So they would have no history and no record of who they were. Very significant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Little factoid that stuck in from some book I read. Mm -hmm. There you go. And here with, there is no moral truth. I, I can't tell you there's a moral truth because it, it, it's not relative to me. I mean, relativism, that if it relates to me in my life, this is my moral truth. And don't you infringe upon it. I believe that, the, and then you can have your own. So there isn't anything that guides our moral truth that as a whole for all humanity, it's, it's relative to who I am mm -hmm. with education makes me more moral. Advancement makes me more moral, more moral. All of these things that we think that makes us a more solid human being and a solid citizen. And we come back to this idea, can, can we really claim to have the authority of God? Can we really claim to have this understanding of what makes a moral society? In John 8, 32, it says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We can all agree with that. Truth makes us free. But who gets to decide what is true? Right. Is it going to be a human being, or is there an entity who created us that has the playbook of this is how you work, and this is how society has been created to function? First John 2, 21. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. I'm writing to you because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. There are lies out there, these cosmic lies. I think that's a fun phrase, cosmic lies, that actually affect us. So we spent a whole bunch of time, just like we have in the podcast today, on this conversing back and forth with the the group that was there last night, because it comes to, there is this template, there is man's wisdom knows no bounds. We really believe this lie, and we live it in our society. Oh my goodness, we worship man's wisdom. And giving the examples of the Tower of Babel and the Titanic, ancient and not less ancient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then looking at our society, currently what's going on as far as lies that, that we we worship intelligence now. And now we're going to look at, there is there is this template, if you will, of what it means to quote unquote, be tempted with things that are not good for us. And we quickly went through this at the end of last night because we're gonna pick it up in the next podcast as well as the next Wednesday night with the Wednesday night crew, looking at this idea of there is a source of evil and this is how it influences us. So. For some of you, you're going to think I'm reading you a fairy tale. And I just, you know, you could think that. Please, you know, I'm not, I'm not challenging that right now. But I would if we were having a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. But this idea of if, if Scripture is the history of mankind, and if it is communicating to us in a multitude of ways, 
looking at this creation story, the part of Genesis, the first five chapters of Genesis basically outline what goes into the rest of the Old Testament. So looking at this, just I would like you to put an opinion on pause and just go, okay, let me entertain what you're saying, Pastor O. Here we go. I'm going to read another seven verses of scripture so we can get the idea behind the whole thing. And then we walk through, and it didn't take very long, picking apart a process. Because what we're looking at here is a template. If there is this source of an entity as a devil, what would, how would that entity try to influence our society? We already looked at one great big lie that man's wisdom knows no bounds in how it's looked in ancient history, more current history, and then today. And here's another process. I believe that this, this temptation template is still used today. See if it resonates with you. Now, the serpent was more cunning, Genesis 3, 1 through 7. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? <laughs> and the woman said to the serpent, um, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband sitting right next to her who was with her and he ate it too. They're there together experiencing this at the same time. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Seriously, Pastor Orlean, you cannot mean that you think this is true. Just take a minute. I'm looking at the template of temptation that is outlined here. If there is a thing, an entity as the devil, as evil, could this be an equation that is used today? First, we begin with Genesis 3, 1a. The serpent was more cunning very cunning, very tricky, very understanding who and how you've been created, wanting to take those feelings and your thought processes and attach them and move them to a different, shift them to a different way of thinking. Now, it's interesting to note that ancient Hebraic society didn't see a serpent as something evil. They seen it as a representation of life and death. So there was a sense of respect towards it. Mm -hmm. They didn't go, oh, Kate. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, get away from me. So they, they've seen it as a source of life and death. But it's interesting, way back in Genesis 2, Adam is told what the serpent is talking about here with Eve. Adam is told about guarding the garden and to put a hedge of thorns around it, keep the perimeter safe, and then be a, a do husbandry, create and cultivate and, and be the farmer of the garden. So be the farmer of the garden, but also the protector of it. So the very fact that we have evil in the garden, things have shifted already. There's things that have happened way before this conversation right. that we know of, that they're there having this conversation with someone who is questioning, questioning God's word and questioning our relationship to God. Now, in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15, it talks about that the enemy will come and don a disguise that we find acceptable. It's called being an angel of light. It looks really good. Right. It looks really smart. Mm -hmm. Has great mathematical skills, great English skills, probably could win a poetry contest. So there's this association of it's an image of respect, but that image should not be in the garden. All right. It's not supposed to be there. They knew that. That's me interpreting scripture. Mm -hmm. Pastor Rowe says they both knew that that thing shouldn't have been there. And that thing that shouldn't have been there, talk to the woman instead of the man, because the man was the one there having the conversation with God when these orders, woman wasn't created yet at that time. Woman was inside of man. She was created. He just hadn't separated them. And yes, that's my interpretation of how that happens. You can disagree with that if you will. But he took something out of Adam and da-da, it was Eve. All right, so so why was the enemy there? And Adam is sitting right next to his wife, and he's not interjecting anything as far as we can tell that's listed there. And The enemy didn't address him, and I'm a bit confused, and there's conversation in my head mm -hmm. up to this point will set aside. Because then the enemy said to him, you shall not eat of every... Did God tell you you can't eat of every tree in the garden? Well, that's 
stupid. He created the garden for them. He used the word every. He's distorting what God has said. So he's making God look like he's an idiot, that he created this thing for you, and, and he's not. So God, we know God's not an idiot, so therefore that means that we don't understand him correctly because we know he's not an idiot, right? So you must not be understanding what God said. Did he say every garden? He does every garden. So this idea of a, a, bringing confusion, distortion, yep. yep, yep, that our biblical knowledge isn't good enough yep. to understand that. Yep. You're just not understanding. Somebody smarter knows better. Um, it actually helps us. Not only do we question our knowledge of Bible, we question the ability of prayer. What does it mean? Right. Is the Holy Spirit real? Can he help? Is that the voice of the Holy Spirit? Oh, I'm crazy if I think the Holy Spirit talks to me today. Ah, blah, blah. So this process is still going on. Mm -hmm. Distort and confuse. And then the woman said, well, la di da <laughs> Have no relationship with evil. Scripture is extremely explicit about that. Have no relationship with evil. You turn around and you walk your fine self away and put evil at your backside. Mm -hmm. I am not engaging in that. Mm -hmm. You do you can tell, you know, when you're having a quote unquote argument maybe with a child <laughs> or someone and you can tell you should have just never responded. Mm -hmm. It's like there is this this circle is never mm -mm. The, the only way to, cycle. Mm -hmm, to get out is keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And it's not accomplishing a thing. So that that's here. This mm -hmm. isn't going to accomplish anything. Turn around and walk away. Mm -hmm. But did not. There was a relationship connection because she starts talking. Well, we can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, in the middle, God said, don't eat it and don't even touch it, which isn't what he said, lest you die. So we see humanity is starting to change what was instructed, creating a, a bigger boundary than what God intended. And the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. God loves you too much. That's my addition. You're not going to die. Why would... A father who loves you put a poisonous tree in the middle of your garden. That type of craziness. And so here we, we find that evil cast out. The enemy cast doubt on the intent of the Lord. And actually he cast doubt on God's character. What kind of God would tell you no to that? And cast doubt on our knowledge of the Lord. Because, you know, this entity of evil, which we put in here as a serpent or a snake, whatever that was there, that, that thing that they were talking to, it's not the garter, the garter snakes we have here in, mm -hmm. or the bull snakes we have here in Minnesota. It's mm -hmm. whatever that was. And so casting doubt, our knowledge, and here's this, this talking creature has to know the creator more than me because it's a talking creature. So all of this, it's a fairy tale, Pastor. Oh, I know it kind of feels that way, but it really isn't. Mm -hmm. It is communicating a temptation process that still happens today. So there is this source in your brain telling you this, that, yeah. Some people say this isn't good, but I want to tell you, it's really good. Why were you created with this if it wasn't good? It makes you feel better, doesn't it? All right. So here he's starting to say, oh, you surely aren't going to die because God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes gonna be, you're going to become like God, honey. It, it makes you what you're supposed to be in the first place, knowing good and evil. So there is the enemy casting doubt on the intent of God. What's his intent with us on our relationship with him, on our knowledge of him, and actually questioning God's character that he's not going to do that to you. So this whole understanding of holiness and righteousness and how we have been created to operate, taking out this whole panel of things saying, oh, they don't matter. You try to do that with the computer and tell me it's going to operate mm -hmm. well. All right. The whole goal is to reconstruct who God is and how he interacts with us. The whole goal of this, of temptation, is to reconstruct all of this. So then there is this portion where in verse 6 she saw that the tree was good, this idea of desire of, of our five senses, sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch. Those things that are out there, of course evil will use them. When, when those senses are satisfied, that's good. You were created to have them. So not even saying that God isn't there, but God's your creator, and it stops there. He doesn't care what you do today. He created you with these senses, so fulfill them to, to bring you joy, because that is how you're supposed to live, blah, 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 blah. So ego is extremely involved. This idea of I can know God better if I do this. This is really, I understand God now. Instead of using scripture as our source, we use life and fulfillment as our source. 
which for some odd reason, have you been ever able to lie to yourself, Robin? <laughs> so so successfully. Right. Yeah. So okay. successfully. Yes, yeah, so I step on my scale and go, good one. Oh, yeah, you just, yeah, right, I'm yeah, not ingesting that many calories. All right. Mm-hmm. So knowing things they were not able to carry. Here, something happened to Adam and Eve when they ate of that fruit. Their eyes were opened, and there's a consequence. Their innocence is gone. Praise God that Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection, has bought that back for us. Mm -hmm. But they began to know things that they could not carry, that they could not understand, that they were not able to hold Mm -hmm. and to process and to live life pleasantly and live life with joy. They're not supposed to know this thing. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's participated in raising children, you know there's different stages where things of understanding are age appropriate. And up until that time, you don't because... It's traumatic for them. Right. So I have to ask myself, what kind of trauma did they experience? They go from not knowing this and then all of a sudden understanding sin and consequence yeah. and separation from the person who is their father and not being able to be in his presence like they were because he can't be in the presence of sin. I believe sin gets incinerated by his presence, so he's not going to be near them. There's no walking in the garden with him in the cool of the day anymore. So it's like I can't be with my dad for the rest of my life because of what I did. That is what they get to experience. Well, and there's, praise the Lord, like you said, there's a recreation in Jesus. However, just like you're saying, we can't ever unring that bell. There is yes. no going back Correct. to that place of innocence before the sin. We are changed. And yes, Jesus redeems us. Praise the Lord that he made that way. But even in our redemption, yes. we can't go back to that state of innocence. No. Of knowledge. Correct. Right. Yes. And we carry that in our humanity. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Ever since Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. And this whole process, we're going to look again next week, but we're going to apply it to the temptation of Christ and seeing the, the different ways of handling instead of the engaging, right. the handing over of, of authority, the dealing with evil in a way we think we can handle right. evil. It's like, no, Scripture's pretty clear about how to handle evil. Right. Let Jesus do it. <laughs> right. And, and, <clears throat> and as you're walking through this process of what happened in the garden, um, I am just reminded you know, when when we're driving down the road and we want to break the speed limit and we break the speed limit, I can break the speed limit with the best of them, right? Um, it, it the the law has been broken. Yes, it, it just is. Uh, I can't go back and unbreak that law. Yes, right. And I think about what happened in the garden, and they were deceived, and they were functioning from all of this stuff. And when God said they were going to die, no, you not, you shall not surely die. And just as faithful as the universal principle of gravity is, yes, the un- whether they believed it or not, right. the universal principle of a change yes. as a result of sin, faithfully happened yes and 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 this this happening this historical narrative that we're blessed with shows us that even in our deception even in anyone's deception not that we would want anyone deceived or ourselves ever but there is a universal principle yes that happens just as faithfully as gravity sin changes things yes and it doesn't matter whether we're deceived. We still reap the consequences Correct. of that deception. Because wherever we are on the planet Earth and we drop a pen, it's going to hit the ground. It's going to hit the ground. So, yes, there are those supernatural laws as well as natural laws, and they operate. Right. And yep. and, and Lord bless us as we yep. move along here with the same respect for this spiritual principle that we have with gravity. Yes. Right? Correct. If I'm going to go stand on something tall, you better believe I'm going to have anchors all around me. Right? <laughs> I'm walking on the inside of the path right. next to the mountain and exactly. not on the outside where there is no... Because yes. I don't want to fall. Guard but there's rail, something yeah. within me that believes that. Yeah. That, that's, that that can happen. Correct. Why do we wear helmets sometimes when we yeah. are yeah. on bicycles? I mean, and so it's like, oh, Lord, put that same respect yeah. for this spiritual principle. Yep. Anyway. Yes, yes. It is. It's intriguing, and it's great conversation, and it should stimulate our brain as well as our spirit. Mm-hmm. It's an engagement of both parts of us. Mm-hmm. So Jesus made these statements, and think of them. As I read them, think of them in this understanding that could there be such an entity, a thing, as, a, as an enemy, as a devil, as a source of evil? 
in John 10, 10, the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. There is a source of evil, and it's all there to steal, kill, and destroy humanity. I have come, Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. I want to fill mm -hmm. your life. It is not, oh, if you're going to be a Christian, you can't, you can't, you can't. It's like, oh, no, if you're going to be a Christian, you can, you can, you can. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, it's just that your you cans aren't going to cost you these consequences of evil. Amen. First Peter 5, 8, Peter is talking about Jesus' principles. I want you to be sober, self-controlled, and I want you to be vigilant. I want you to be watchful because you have an adversary, the devil, who goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. A very active force here, wanting your life to not be pleasing to Christ. Well, actually wanting you to, to not be effective at all. Mm -hmm. Wanting die. to harass yep. you. Yes. Luke twenty two thirty one, And Jesus said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. What a crazy natural statement mm -hmm. referring to a supernatural thing. Mm-hmm brings into mind the book of Job and how that outlines this exactly. whole process. So there is this, he has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. So if there is a source of evil, that's what he wants to do. That's what it wants to do. Can't right. give it a male-female thing here, but that's right. what it wants to do. Right. And look at your progression there, Pastor Orlean. Uh, the Lord says to Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter. Yes. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you. And then we are blessed with Peter's own comments. In mm -hmm. First Peter mm -hmm. five eight, that yes. you highlight. Yes, this is what you need to do about the devil because I know this now. Uh -huh. <laughs> I understand it personally. I understand it personally. Oh this, yes. yes, thank you, Peter, for your knowledge. Yep. Amen. And it's amazing to read Christian history and the amount of honor how Peter was just honored, even though Paul had the bulk of the work of building the church. Mm -hmm. Not. I know I'm not saying that accurately, but how, just how Peter was honored yeah. for how he handled his betrayal of Christ, where Judas went and committed mm -hmm. suicide over it. Peter went and jumped back into the community and was transparent and embarrassed and lived with it the rest of his life. So he can say this, and everybody knows he knows because mm -hmm. he's been there. Amen. So he's this walking billboard of Jesus' love and reconciliation. So here in closing, which is going to take a little bit, all right? There is this that this effect. It's called the Flynn effect. It's actually a, a phrase, and it says that we are smarter than our grandparents. Now we know better. Look at us. We're so fine. Believing that in our evolutionary process, we're going to get smarter and smarter and smarter, and they have proven that it's an actual fluke. <laughs> that the IQ has been falling in the West and hasn't been ri rising since the 1990s. And I didn't do the research. I'm reading someone else's. So this knowledge, as we have been measuring it, is not growing. But we should have an increasing IQ, according to the Flynn effect, every every generation. It should be getting in higher and higher because there's so much knowledge out there. But I love this question. Is knowledge the same thing as intelligence? Hmm. Is knowledge, do you know somebody who's filled with knowledge and would you say that they are intelligent? To me, they're two different things. And is intelligence the same thing as wisdom, being able to apply it? Knowing stuff is one thing. Knowing how to live it is another. So what is knowledge? What is intelligence? And what is wisdom? What would you say is somebody who really understands truth? If I'm going to go get help from someone, it's going to be somebody who knows truth. I want to go to someone who is wise. So when we even look at this idea of man's intelligence, man's wisdom knows no bonds, well, let me really ask the question, is man really wise? What, what, what do I use as a, as a litmus? What do I use to measure somebody's wisdom? 2 Timothy 3.7 tells us this. People are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're always learning this lie that knowledge makes us wise. Mm -hmm. That's the crux of it. Knowledge doesn't make, make us wise. <laughs> so here is my wrap-up question. I guess I got here faster than I thought. <laughs> If this really is happening in our society, wherever you go and you, you can feel the shadow of people not wanting to know that you live your life as a Christian according to biblical principles, and we know it. I know all of us, when you're in certain groups, you know when to not talk about politics and faith. But I have to wonder 
what would happen if we just took one thing, just one thing that we do. This this concept of prayer is, is real. Prayer invites the supernatural into our natural. So we're asking for God's power to come into our natural. Not that we can boss God around and tell him what to do and that we earn this. Oh, my goodness. No, that is evil and so incorrect. Ugh, we won't even go that direction. But prayer as this conduit of I want God's will in my life. I want to know what his will is. I want I want to share that with others. But how... How often do we pray for people out in the public or as we're engaging them outside of church things or Christendom? Do we hesitate to even bring it up when someone is sharing something hard with us because we're not sure how they're going to respond to it? It's like, I don't want to put this wedge in our relationship. What happens if you're out somewhere and you're in a Mart store and you see a calamity happen or somebody there is just having you can tell they were just on the phone and all of a sudden they're crying or whatever would you ever consider going up to that individual and asking if they're okay and once you're assured that they're whatever asking if you can pray for them so my challenge last night as it will be at the end of this podcast right here and right now is how can you start bringing your christian faith into your everyday life and my one thing, my one thought, and it is, it, it shows the heart of Christ, is when we bring prayer, the ability to pray for someone and asking, not just doing it. It's like, could I pray for you? And if they say no, it's like, okay, thank you for letting me know, but I will put you in my prayer journal so I'll remember to keep praying for you. Um, letting them know that you are going to pray for them privately, but asking if you can do it together. Because when you do it with someone, you're inviting the supernatural to come down into that community of two people or three people instead of just with you. And scripture talks about that happening where two or three are gathered. He's in our midst when we invite him in there. So what happens if we take the application of, all right, maybe there is an entity of evil. You could call it the devil, but let's, there is, here is something I can do to combat it. I can live my faith out loud without feeling embarrassed, without feeling marginalized, without feeling like I'm stupid and being ridiculed and figuring out a way to respond to people who might ridicule you pray for me you got to be kidding it's like oh absolutely not not kidding at all but if it's offensive to you i will i would not do that with you i just are you okay and then moving on learning how to handle that but what happens if we start bringing the the unbelievable supernatural skill natural skill and supernatural skill into our everyday life wherever it is and asking permission to pray and seeing what happens when we do that. Almost to the point, if you're crazy enough and understand what it is to use anointing oil, to carry that in a, a something that you have, and we anoint for health, and we anoint for God's direction, or, or you know, a person being called. You can anoint a person being called, and things for health is what I see Scripture prescribing it for. It's not something you bathe in, in other words. Not that there's anything inherent in the oil. It's in the process of saying, God, I understand this is consecrated to you. So what happens if we start doing that and seeing what happens? Is there a change in the world around us? Is there a change inside of me? Is there something that I can push back against this lie that man's wisdom is greater than God's wisdom and I can do it in such a positive manner and not not hurting or harming anyone, but doing in the positive thing that it is going to be helpful. So there is my challenge. If you come up with a different idea of living your faith more out loud, of living your faith in your everyday life and just relaxing, I would love to hear it. It's Orlean, O-R-L-E-E-N, at realchurch.org. Because it's always fascinating to me the little steps that we can take that have major effect on our life as well as the people that we love and invest in. Thank you so much for joining us on today's discussion here on Chew on This, where we're going through the summer of lies, how lies are told to us. Um, we are lied by the devil. And I want to invite you to join us next week when Pastor Orlean is going to be unpacking for us, lied to by ourselves. That's going to be absolutely <laughs> Self fascinating. Self-deception. What? <laughs> so I also do want to invite you um, to join us in person here at the uh, Forest Lake campus at Maranatha Church at 6 30 p.m. on Wednesday evenings and you'll have a chance to enjoy this discussion along with all the rest of us live and please remember you can always check out the resources on our webpage realchurch.org 
forward slash Wednesday night, and you'll be able to get all of Pastor Orlean notes, uh, Pastor Orlean's notes and references. Um, and today, wherever we find ourselves, let's love God and love people. See you next week for Chew on This. <laughs>